On today's show, Apple's 12-inch MacBook Revival, how popular will the iPhone 13 be? M1X MacBook Pros are in production, and iOS 14.8 is coming? I'm Mike F. David and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring that bell so you don't miss a thing. So first up, Apple has started asking its customers uh, who own the 12-inch MacBook, the one from 2015, 2016, went all the way through till 2019 when they discontinued it and that was when they redesigned the MacBook Air to have a retina display, finally. So Apple sent this survey out to uh, people that owned those to find out what they liked about them, what they disliked about them, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, I did a quick short on YouTube about this last night, uh, and I said I would be expanding in this video, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about how it's going to be positioned, if it's something that happens. This is all very speculative at this point. But we have a few things that we can look at and a few things that we can potentially um, borrow some ideas from. So let's get into that. First of all, we had an iCave answer, which is quite relevant, so we'll do that now. Ryan Bellinger asks iCave answers. Do you think that the starting price for the hypothetical replacement to the 12-inch MacBook will be lower compared to the M1 MacBook Air? And this is a difficult one to uh, answer because nobody knows what Air means, and that includes Apple. So I think... What all of this comes down to is how Apple's going to position it within their range. Because originally when uh, the MacBook and the MacBook Pro were the two models, this is like right back at the beginning, pre-2008, uh, we didn't have a MacBook Air. We had MacBook and we had MacBook Pro. Now, MacBook had flat sides. In fact, this is one of the first MacBooks. So this is the MacBook uh, 2007 model, I want to say, 2008 eight maybe 2009 this is the black book and it's a macbook it still looks quite familiar as a macbook um nice keys uh didn't have the backlit keys quite a lot of connectivity with some polystyrene in that one um but yes this was the macbook so this was the kind of chunkier one came with the plastic body and that's uh what made it a bit cheaper now at the time, they started at $9.99, which is now what the MacBook Air starts at. When the MacBook Air was brought in, it was brought in above the MacBook. So the MacBook Air was thinner and lighter and slightly less capable because it didn't have a CD-ROM or DVD drive, for example. But it was a more premium device because thin and light wasn't really a thing at that point until MacBook Air kind of invented that. But then as time went on, Apple eliminated the MacBook and just kept around the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. So it was kind of thin and light uh, or power. Those were your options. And now it looks like we might be getting back to having a basic laptop and a MacBook Air that's kind of a nicer one and maybe the MacBook Pro that's the really nice one. And I think when we're talking about at the moment, at least, with everything having just the M1 chip in it, we are really talking about uh, nice, nicer, and nicest, rather than uh, least to most powerful, because at the moment, there isn't much differentiation. But this is where they could actually differentiate, because we know that the M1 has all of the power. We know that the M1 has come in as basically the lowest version of Apple Silicon that would ever be made, or so we thought. But what if Apple was to take the 12-inch uh, MacBook body, maybe spin uh, spread out that display a little bit so that it gets up to 13 inches with just thinner bezels in the same chassis. That would be pretty awesome. But instead of putting in there an M1, perhaps they put in an A15. So this year's iPhone chip that's on the way, it's going to be a little bit quicker than the M1 in terms of single core performance, won't have as many cores, so it won't be as great at heavy duty like video rendering and that sort of stuff. But in theory, it should be just as snappy at doing the actual edits, as long as you're not doing anything that's incredibly heavy. And then when it comes to the render time, it just takes a little bit longer. Now, this also wouldn't have a fan, so it would be very much like an iPhone. And I think that could be quite compelling. So if they were to do that, I think they would go for a lower price point. So for something like that, perhaps they could go as low as, I don't know, $7.99, maybe even lower. I don't know. But $7.99 for an A15 powered laptop doesn't sound like a bad thing at all. I would think that would be pretty capable for what most people actually use a MacBook for. The vast majority of people remember as well who don't watch a channel like this, which is talking about all of the powerful stuff, probably use it for doing email, surfing the internet, using pages, numbers, keynote, that kind of stuff. 
the usual stuff that most people use a computer for, not people that are computery people. But they might also like the niceness that you get with a Mac. Now, there's every chance that this could be the one that we've seen uh, some leaks for, that we've had Apple Tomorrow do some renders for, and John Prosser has had uh, Ian Zeblo do some uh, renders for, but we don't know. It could be that that is the new chassis for it. It is just as thick as the USB-C port, basically. Maybe it's not going to be a new MacBook Air. Maybe it is going to be a MacBook. We said this from day one. I think Luke Miani has kind of agreed with us on that one as well. Um, so it could be that that's just the MacBook. It could be that the MacBook Air keeps its wedge shape. We just don't know yet. That remains to be seen. But let me know what you think down in the comments section. Next up. 43.7% of iPhone users plan to upgrade to the iPhone 13. Now that seems pretty high to me, although uh, initially when I was thinking about it, I thought they meant of iPhone 12 users. Um, and I don't think people upgrade that often. Most people, you know, normal people who don't run a YouTube channel to talk about it all day. So I don't think that that would be particularly practical. But when you're thinking about all of the people that own iPhones, that's like nearly a billion devices. So are they going to sell 500 million of these i don't think so or 437 yeah 437 million of them like that seems like a lot um so intent obviously doesn't translate directly to sales but we have also found out that the most popular reasons to upgrade are 120 hertz pro motion display the in display touch id and the always on display and we're almost certain that it's going to get the 120 hertz pro motion display the touch id thing not so much it doesn't look like that's going to happen this year and always on display i mean that should be possible with uh, what they have in that variable refresh rate because that's kind of what enables it the fact that you can take it down to being like one hertz but we don't know that that's coming and uh, they haven't released an updated home screen look either but it could be that they're holding on to that for the iphone 13 announcement and in terms of the stuff that people were a lot less bothered about now, one and a half percent of people or less cared about Wi-Fi 6E, portless iPhones or reverse wireless charging. Now, Wi-Fi 6E, I think it's probably because most people don't know what it is. And also getting a Wi-Fi 6 or 6E router for your home is quite expensive and probably won't make much difference to your speeds as you see them. Um, portless iPhones, uh, it, it's not really an exciting thing, I guess. It's one of those things that's not particularly like... A benefit but it's not a loss but i'm sure apple will find a way to sell it as a benefit and reverse wireless charging most people probably don't know what that is but if you didn't know what it is it basically means that you can turn your iphone over and you can put another device on top of it and charge it from your iphone wirelessly so things like airpods that would be really useful for also if you were traveling uh, like in hotels you could take one charger with you you could plug your iphone into said charger put it by your bedside put it face down put your airpods on top and it becomes like a wireless charging mat i feel like that's a pretty cool idea but are you planning on getting the iphone 13 let me know down there and m1x macbook pros have entered mass production according to digitimes six to eight hundred thousand units a month are going to be produced between now and november now that is across the 14 inch and 16 inch models and because this comes from digitimes uh, we could basically find a uh, coin and flip it, and that will be just as accurate as Digitimes. However, it does line up with some other reports that have come out from other people. So in this case, I think they're probably right. And also, they tend to be better on timelines than they are on feature stuff. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt now. But what does this mean for the MacBook Pro's release date? Well, it's the 9th of August as I'm recording this. We're expecting the event to be around about the 14th of September. So let's put that at five weeks away. That seems fairly safe. We also don't think necessarily that the uh, MacBooks are going to be shipped on the same day as the iPhones. The iPhones will probably ship uh, a week after the event and arrive with people pretty soon afterwards. And then the MacBooks will probably go on pre-order the week after the iPhones uh, arrive with people and then ship to people the week after that. So we're actually talking about five weeks uh, until the event and then probably four weeks after that before they're actually in people's hands. So we're talking about nine weeks. That's plenty of time for Apple to get production up and running. And if they're putting out uh, six to eight hundred thousand a month, that means between one point two and 1.6 million units available at launch and we have to remember that although we are all excited about macbook pros uh, with the m1x chip 
the vast, 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 vast majority of people who are buying a MacBook will buy a MacBook Air. And if they don't buy a MacBook Air, they'll be buying the base level MacBook Pro. So these higher end ones, although we've been very excited about them, they're not going to sell as much volume as the uh, MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro with M1s have already, probably. But I've mentioned this before as well, the 14th of September date uh, for the iPhone event. The reasons that I think that the uh, MacBook Pros are coming on that date are, number one, the EEC filings, which said basically that we've got the iPhones, the Apple Watches, and mobile Macs being registered at the same time. No iPads in there, which suggests to me that they're coming in another event later on because we very much uh, are expecting to get iPads as well this, uh, this year. So my thought is that because... M1 was so well received and uh, they don't have to explain what Apple Silicon is anymore. They can get sort of straight into the differences between M1 and M1X and show how fast these laptops are. Because they know how well M1's been received, they now know how well software works with them and they know that the coverage is going to be pretty positive. I think they want to throw these super powerful laptops that are going to be around about twice the power in terms of CPU and all maybe up to four times the power on GPU in front of a lot of people. And I mean like iPhone event numbers of people, which is definitely the iPhone event, the biggest event of the year for Apple. That's why I think they're throwing it out there because I think they'll be talking about M1 as well and then talking about how even better M1X is. This is going to be a massive event. Next up, iOS 14.8 is on the way, but 15 is only a few weeks away as well, as we've just discussed. It's probably going to be within the next well, less than two months before we have iOS 15 on our devices. So why are they doing iOS 14.8? Well, the rumors are that this is uh, going to be an option for people that don't want to move up to iOS 15 for some of the privacy um, changes that are coming. Things like the uh, iCloud Plus uh, VPN style service and things like that. So there are certain parts of iOS 15 that I guess some people might not like. Maybe some people are a bit sceptical about the new Safari redesign, which seems to be one of the favourites for people to talk about on podcasts. Uh, but I think it's kind of cool. I'm, I'm well away with it. But a lot of people seem to be finding it difficult to get used to having that uh, address bar down at the bottom. But uh, regardless of that, it is on the way. It looks like it's probably going to be mainly security stuff um, just to make sure that uh, the iPhones are secure iOS 15 is coming out too, so that's really the one to get more excited about. And we're going to move into some iCave answers now. If you want to get a question in the show, hashtag iCave answers down in the comments section. Marcin Kowalczyk asks, what are your thoughts on the notion of only portless iPhones in the future? Good for endurance, but MagSafe only. So yeah, the reason that these are good for endurance is basically if you uh, get your phone wet, you're not going to have liquid in the charging port, which is one of the easiest ways that you can zap your iPhone and kind of brick it or at least fry a charger. And yes, I do think that MagSafe is probably going to be the main way of doing it, because if you think about it, everyone's concern is what if I need to restore my iPhone? What if I need to recover it? What if I need to do something like that? Which in the past has always been done by plugging it into a computer, plugging it into iTunes. But as we're moving more and more away from um, being tethered to a computer, uh, and, and this is something that we've we've really got away from. There's a lot of people that are now only having an iPhone or an iPad as their main computing device. They wouldn't have a laptop or a desktop because people don't need them in a lot of cases these days you know they might have they might have one at work that they have to use but for for their own personal stuff pretty much their phone or ipad is absolutely adequate from that point of view i think that apple is going to need to find a way that you can do these recoveries without needing to plug into anything else and i don't see why that would be a problem because let's be honest if your Mac dies, what do you do? As long as you've got power to it or, you know, some uh, some battery in the thing, you put it into recovery mode and it can uh, basically repair its own operating system from an internal partition. I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that comes to the iPhones and worst case scenario, an internet recovery mode, which uses Wi-Fi as you do on a Mac in order to, again, grab a fresh copy of the operating system if that's what it needs to do its repairs. I don't see why we would need to have a physical wired connection to do repairs at this point. Next up, Evan Rogers asks IK Vancers regarding Intel's recent fab roadmap. Do you think that they will be able to meet their targets or is this all just 10 nanometers all over again? Now, I think that 
Intel has kind of muddied the waters a little bit with changing the names of some of the chips. However, everyone seems to use their own naming conventions because it doesn't particularly relate to the actual size of the transistors anymore. Uh, and also, once you get in down to smaller units, you kind of need to use something other than nanometers, which makes sense. But I do think Intel's still going to struggle, struggle a little bit because although they've got an engineer in charge now, they still have kind of the same teams there. Uh, they still have the same people trying to build these fabs that can make these chips at uh, at scale and uh, reliably enough. I'm not holding out a huge amount of hope. Bruce Grubb asks, IK Vances, you said that a lot of people would be angry if Apple switched from Lightning to USB-C, uh, but then said not to expect any holes or ports in the next year's iPhones. Wouldn't that have the same effect? And if not, why not? Now, that is a stunningly good point, And if I'm completely honest, it's my own fault for not explaining this particularly well. Apple is moving towards this portless thing regardless. What I was trying to explain more than anything else is that people would be more annoyed, especially if Apple moved from Lightning to USB-C and then went to portless quite quickly afterwards. Even if it was within sort of three to five years afterwards, I think they would be very, very angry. So I think because Apple has had in their minds that they were going to move to uh, wireless charging standards since probably 2017 which is also i think if you uh, if you remember back when the ipad pro first got usb-c um not obviously now the ipad pros have thunderbolt version of usb-c but that shape of port when that changed that was 2017 and i think apple was already on the way to doing kind of wireless first charging and probably looking to eliminate the port back then. So that's been four years since then. Uh, and I think it's those past four years where people have got more and more annoyed that Apple has got lightning instead of USB-C, especially where the iPad Pros have got it. I think this is where the frustrations come from. And I think that Apple needs to move to that wireless future with the MagSafe charging in order to kind of skip over the USB-C generation. I think that's where we need to be going and showing how you just literally don't need to plug your iPhone into anything anymore. One of the other things that I think Apple might be attempting to do uh, partially with this is removing the option for people to brute force through iPhones because things like the gray boxes that some law enforcement can use and obviously then find their way out onto the gray market too. They use a USB uh, to lightning cable in order to um, basically hack straight into the iPhone. It's not an easy process. It still takes a long time, but it basically allows you to brute force it over time. If you take those ports away, that ain't happening anymore. So I think it's also adding security for Apple at that point. But I think the main thing is uh, in terms of durability for the devices, if you're doing MagSafe charging, you're not going to fry it with water in your charge port. Ryan Ballinger asks, IK Vances, do you think that Apple will release a HomePod dock for the iPad Pro and iPad Air 4? No, I do not. And I will tell you exactly why. We have HomePods. Um, the HomePod is basically a wireless dock for these things. It is the easiest way to airplay your music. They sound really good. And I don't think there's any uh, particular advantage to physically plugging it into a speaker. You might get slightly less lag, but then you would only really need less lag if you're doing some sort of gaming on this iPad. And you're unlikely to be kind of attaching it to a speaker stand to then game on especially if you're using the screen to control rather than a controller but yeah i just don't think uh, we need physical docks anymore i think that's why we have wireless uh, audio and we have airplay alan b unboxings and news asks ik answers uh what up dave do you like dc or marvel better really difficult question probably marvel overall in terms of uh consistency and quality dc has had some crackers though the suicide squad is fantastic would you go to the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser? Again, no idea what that is. I don't Star War. And IK Vances, will you ever make an unboxing on your channel of new Apple products coming out this year and next year? So we have done unboxings in the past. We did do the uh, MacBook Air with M1 on the day of release. We actually got it quite early on the day as well. I think there was about two or three... Uh, live streams that were already up um, with people unboxing and starting to test stuff but we tested it right here uh, we ran it through Geekbench we did all that sort of stuff because this is one that my wife bought to be her uh, machine for university um, for her masters and so uh, yeah we, we got to unbox it and play with it before she got hold of it which was uh, which was kind of fun but I'll be honest I'm not a massive fan of doing unboxing videos like it's interesting 
once, but uh, but in a, in a lot of cases, like once you've seen an unboxing, like you know what's there. There's not a lot else to say, and kind of everyone knows what's in the box by the time they get the box, pretty much. I think that's the sort of thing that generally we should leave to like I Justine, who does an incredible job of that kind of thing. Marquez, um, unbox therapy, I guess. I'm not a massive fan of Lou, but yeah, he does unboxings. So that's it for today's show, guys. Don't forget IKversary. We have started to uh, block in the timings now for some of these guests. There's a few actually uh, into the schedule. Four o'clock, there is one of our big guests. That was all I will tell you. I will not tell you which of the big guests it is coming at four o'clock, but one of the big guests will be coming at 4 p.m. GMT. So make sure you're there. But you're going to want to be there for the whole thing. So uh, if you're in the States, you know, it's something to watch while you eat your breakfast for six hours. Looking forward to it, guys. Thank you so much. And we will see you in the next video. Bye.